Hi. Hi, how are you? Good yeah. afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Tuesday Talks at the Atwood. Uh, I'm your host and executive director, Kevin Wright, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, before I introduce this evening's speaker, a few housekeeping items that I usually do. Uh, the Atwood Museum is now in full operation and open to the public on Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Uh, we still encourage reservations, which can be made through our website, uh, but we also welcome walk-ins, uh, depending on the space availability, uh, availability when you arrive. If you have not visited the museum this year, please plan on visiting us. We'd love to see you. Uh, our next virtual lecture will be held on Tuesday, July 20th at 5 p.m. of the Birdmen of Cape Cod with local author Paul Caprikos. Paul will be discussing his new book, uh, Killing Icarus. Uh, if you have kids or grandkids who like pirates, please make your plans to join us for Pirates Day on July 31st. Uh, check out our website for additional information. It should be fun for the entire family. Finally, don't forget to mark your calendar for an evening to remember our annual fundraising event, Saturday, August 28th from 5 to 7.30. This year's event will once again take place at Sea Levy, the beautiful home of Jamie and John Seldorf, located in North Chatham. Ticket information can be found on our website in the next couple of days, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, and finally, if you are uh, enjoying our Tuesday Talks, please consider donating. Your kind generosity helps us keep this program going. Ellie will add a link to the chat for your convenience. During the talk, if you have any questions for our speaker, please write them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our speaker will answer all your questions immediately following this evening's talk, time permitted. So you've heard enough from me. Time to introduce our speaker. Author, lecturer, and screenplay screen screen writer, Janet's genre is rarely seen, and her passion for the American Revolution is evident. Janet firmly believes that when the private lives and unique personalities of historical figures are presented and the dynamics between these characters brought out, history becomes much more than cold black print on a stark white page. History takes on a life of its own with true flesh and blood individuals whose acts of courage, indifference, and cowardice shaped the world we live in today. This living history helps us relate to those who have gone before, offering inspiration, courage, and his sense of determination. Janet has authored three books, Liberty's Martyr, the story of Dr. Joseph Warren, uh, Freedom's Cost, the story of General Nathaniel Green, and Truth Be Damned. In addition, she's done a screenplay of uh, Liberty's Martyr. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce to you, Janet Eulah. Hello. Can you everybody hear me okay? Sounds great, Janet. Okay. So I'm going to get the PowerPoint up and running. Let's see if we can do it like we did it on the other night when we practiced it. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Are you guys see? Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see okay. the screen. You just want to make it full screen, Jen. Okay. Let me go to that. I know you guys walked me through it the other night. <laughs> go up to slideshow. There you go. Okay, here we go. But it's not responding this time. There it goes. Okay. I see it now. Okay, is it full screen for you guys? Just, just hit from the beginning and you should be fine. Okay, yeah. Is that full screen? Not quite. It might be just a slight delay. Let's see. There you go. I think you might have clicked it now. Okay, good. Good, good. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. There you go. We're Hopefully, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I am delighted to be here this evening. Um, and in preparing this, I realized that it has been a few years since I have presented Joseph Warren. So it's been fun uh, getting it together and getting the cobwebs out of my mind <laughs> so I can do this properly. Um, I do refer to this um, talk um, in general as had he survived the American Revolution the name of Washington might have been obscured. Um, and we hopefully we will cover why I believe that as we continue. Now, um, people often ask me what inspired me to research Joseph Warren. I actually began my research, oh gosh, about 32 years ago now on Warren. And um, it came from childhood, uh, a passion that was stirred in childhood. When I was in fourth grade, the fourth grade teacher, the first day of school said, whoever read the most books that year would get a prize. And um, that was exciting to me. I came from a family of 10 children and, and you know, I, any prize was just thrilling. And my dad's favorite saying was to turn off the TV and read a book. So um, I did, I, I won the prize that year. I don't remember most of the books. The one I do remember is Johnny Tremaine. And no, I don't remember what the prize was. But Esther Forbes's Johnny Tremaine um, opened up to me a world that has stayed with me since. And most of the characters that she presented in this fictional account were true historical characters that I recognized their names. There were a couple I had never heard of and I would never hear of in my formal education. And they were Dr. Joseph Warren and Josiah Quincy Jr., who I like to um, introduce as well in my Warren talk. Um, and before I get started, I want to point out, and I, um, when I reflect on the American Revolution, whenever I reflect on it, even in these 30 plus years I've been studying it, I'm always amazed to realize that these individuals should not have won. And um, they knew that. I mean, they were facing the most powerful country in the world at the time with the most powerful army and Navy. And there were a bunch of soldiers, I mean, farmers, you know, lawyers, doctors, um, merchants, this type of thing. They didn't have what it took to stand up to Great Britain, but that didn't stop them. And it was a war that I like to think anyway, like none other really, it was a war, a pure war, if there can be such a thing. Um, these men, these women were standing on ideals and principles, uh, beliefs that they uh, felt that these, this was their God-given right, the things that Great Britain was going against them on. And it was um, rich man standing alongside poor man. It wasn't a bunch of powerful, wealthy political figures sending other men's sons out to do battle for them. They were there as well with their sons. And when you stop and think about that, it's quite remarkable. And again, they didn't, <laughs> all the odds were against them. Um, but they, they went forth and did this anyway. And I just like to lay the groundwork with that thought. Now, Joseph Warren, uh, uh, the name isn't known to very many. Uh, he was born in 1741 in Roxbury, Massachusetts. He was the oldest of four sons. Um, it was a farming family, uh, Joseph and Mary Stevens Warren. And he already had a remarkable heritage in that his great-grandfather had stood opposed to the um, Salem witch hunts and made it well known. Um, so this was a family that wasn't afraid to speak up when they saw injustice. Now the Warren farm was actually a 90 acre um, apple orchard. Uh, these apples still grow in Roxbury today and they're referred to as the Roxbury russets or the Warren russets. You can get them in heirloom catalogs as a matter of fact still. When Joseph was um, about 12, 13, 
his father passed away. His father was picking apples from the trees and fell off and broke his neck. And this was witnessed by Joseph's youngest brother, who you can see in this picture, um, John, Jack Warren, who would also follow in uh, Joseph's uh, footsteps and become a physician. And um, hopefully time will allow us to talk more about Jack Warren as well. You know, condensing all of this um, is difficult because there's so much the groundwork for understanding Joseph Warren and the people that he was related to and involved with. Uh, just fascinating stories all around. Now, after Joseph's father died, the um, town of Roxbury put money together to send him to Harvard. Uh, his mother was gonna run the farm on her own uh, with her younger sons, and Joseph would attend Harvard as was planned. Now, when there are children in the audience, I just love to see their faces when I say this, Joseph was 14 years old when he began at Harvard. And no, it wasn't because he was a boy genius. It was the average age for the young men to enter Harvard. And in order to enter Harvard, they had to speak Latin fluently. And between their freshman and sophomore year at Harvard, they had to translate the New Testament of the Bible from the King's English into Latin. Um, a pretty remarkable feat when you stop and think about it. Now, his hope was to go uh, to study medicine, but of course at Harvard, it was just more general studies. And following their education, they would go into an apprenticeship program to focus in on what they wanted to do in life. Now, when Joseph graduated from Harvard, uh, the money just wasn't there for him to go into an apprenticeship right away, or maybe ever as far as he knew. His mother was struggling with the farm, raising the boys. And uh, so he began teaching at the Roxbury Latin School, which is uh, in Boston to this day. He had been a pupil at the Roxbury Latin and now he would teach. And he went in um, and you know earned, earned his wages for teaching and handed all of it over to his mother to take care of the family. He also obviously would work on the 90 acre orchard. Now, his mother was a woman ahead of her time, Mary Stevens Warren, and she was determined. Her father had been an, um, a physician, and she was determined that Joseph would follow uh, in his footsteps. But she didn't want Joseph to just go to any um, a master to teach him. She sought out the most prestigious physician in Boston at that time, who was Dr. James Lloyd. Lloyd had, had um, studied in Europe. So he brought um, much in, uh, to his home when he taught his apprentices. Now, in order to afford um, this apprenticeship with James Lloyd, Mary uh, Warren put up one third to one half of the um, orchard in payment. In other words, if Joseph didn't pay Dr. Lloyd back after becoming his own master and setting up his own practice, then Lloyd could come and step in and take the family's legacy, half of it, the orchard. Uh, we're told that Joseph wasn't too appreciative of this fact. He felt um, pressured by it, but, but he did what his mother wanted him to do. And I also like to say, you know, the kids, we talked today about loans for going to school. Uh, it happened back then as well, obviously. And over, um, you see the picture, tools of the trade. Those actually were some of the um, tools that his brother had that somebody took a picture of. So we can see the amputation and saws and all that type of thing. Now, when Joseph finished up his apprenticeship, two years, um, the smallpox epidemic hit Boston in around 1763. And at that time it was illegal for physicians to give inoculation for smallpox. So many of the physicians were doing this secretly um, 
for fear of being caught and arrested. But when they saw how much it helped individuals, they were determined that they were going to inoculate. So Joseph began doing this on his own as he became a, a new physician. And then he actually went out to Castle Island, which is um, just off the Boston coastline. And they set up a hospital there, a smallpox hospital. And he stayed there for a few months taking care of the patients there. When he came back to Boston and he was ready to set up his practice officially, he uh, uh, met a lot of people both in the smallpox hospital and at Dr. Lloyd's who came and became his patients. He was ready to marry. Uh, he married Elizabeth Hooten Warren, who uh, her dad had passed away. She was the only child and she had a good sized inheritance. They would have five children in their short marriage. Elizabeth would die in 1773 at the age of 27, and only one of their children would not survive childhood. Now, to lay the groundwork of the colonial grievances against Parliament, um, most people, most Americans, sadly, believe that the whole uh, war was fought over a tax on tea. And um, uh, far from the truth, there were many, many things coming down for a good 10, 12, 15 years before the war broke out of parliamentary acts of taxation, interferences with the judicial system, restrictions on trade, and bring a standing army into Boston when the um, Bostonians reacted um, to one of the parliamentary acts, the Townsend Acts, um, that is when the first standing army came to Boston. And of course we can see the acts here, some of them, uh, seven, starting in 1763, the Proclamation Act, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, and the Intolerable Acts. And we will get into um, getting to understand the intolerable acts a little bit more as we go along. As I said, it was the response of the Bostonians to the Townsend Acts, which basically laid a tax on almost everything you could imagine. Again, taxation without representation and um, the standing army was set to keep Boston in line. Now in 1765, these two gentlemen started what has been referred to as the Long Room Club. Um, basically, it was the think tank of the pre-revolution. They handpicked the members, Sam Adams, Adams and James Otis would handpick the members. And Sam would keep an eye on the boys coming out of Harvard. Um, and then the boys that the young men that were just setting up their practices, whether it be in law or in medicine, ministers, merchants, and invite certain of them to join this club. Now, there was never a list kept of the members. We know many of them, here's only a few listed, Sam Adams, James Otis, John Hancock, John Adams, Joseph Warren, Paul Revere, Samuel Quincy, and Josiah Quincy Jr. Any leading patriot you can think of from Boston at this, at this time most likely belonged to the, um, the Long Room Club. The interesting thing was, from what we know of the members, all of them, that are known except for Paul Revere were Harvard or Yale graduates. The accomplishments of the Long Room Club were in the 10 years that they existed before the war broke out to communicate with the friends in parliament, to educate the public, to lay the groundwork for boycotts against British goods, which was the most powerful way of um, opposing Great Britain in pre-revolutionary uh, years. They also established the Intercolonial Committees of Correspondence, which, was, which if it had not been established, 
probably the formation of the first Continental Congress would have been delayed if it happened at all. That's how vital that was. There was a donations committee which took money that was being given to the Bostonians and put to work the men who had no jobs because when the, the ports of Boston were closed. And out of the sun, the, um, the Long Room Club also came the Sons of Liberty. Now we talked about them sending a standing army, Great Britain Parliament, um, following the Townsend Acts. And this was in a direct, viol a direct violation to English law. They kind of just moved into Boston. They established um, curfews on all the citizens of Boston. Um, they, if, as you can imagine, an army being in a city, uh, just horrific things happening. And this went on for a couple of years, and then we have all heard about the Boston Massacre, and I'm going through this stuff quick, folks, so I'm sorry. Um, the Boston Massacre occurred in 1770. It was a direct response to the Standing Army in Boston, although I will say the British soldiers were tormented by the colonists that night. So it wasn't a, a one side and that's, that's what happened. There were, there were different sides to be told. And following the Boston massacre, the next day, the captain of the guard that fired on the American colonists sought out legal help because he and his soldiers were, going, were, going, were arrested and going to trial. And he sought out the help of different Tory attorneys in Boston who turned him down, who wanted nothing to do with this situation. It was a volatile situation. So this captain actually sought out the help of a young colonist, and we mentioned his name earlier, Josiah Quincy Jr. Now I'm going to tell you a story about the Boston Massacre. As I said, I try to include Josiah Quincy Jr. in this story of Warren because they were very close. Um, Josiah, whenever we hear the story of the Boston Massacre, whenever we read of it, HBO did a series on John Adams, and that's this picture here comes from that series. We are told that John Adams was the attorney that defended the British. And there is no mention whatsoever, usually in history books or on TV, about Josiah Quincy Jr. Now, Josiah Quincy was only in his early 20s when this happened. And his older brother Samuel, 10 years his senior, Josiah adored his brother Samuel. And if you remember the list earlier of the Long Room Club, we had both Josiah and Samuel listed as members. Samuel was a member, but he was offered a position by parliament to be the Solicitor General of um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. I'm gonna flip ahead here to see if, no. And in that, um, in that offer, he felt that he would have more insight to what was going on with Parliament. And this was what he was telling his friends in the Long Room Club. Um, and they feared that maybe he would be too influenced by Parliament. And it wasn't long before those fears played out because basically you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And Sam became a loyalist uh, in a short time and left the Long Room Club. So he and his brother Josiah were now politically opposed to one another. But the irony of the Boston Massacre trials is this, Josiah agreed to take on the defense of these soldiers because he believed with everything in him that if he was to stand and fight for liberty and try to educate people about liberty, he had to believe it even when it came to defending people that he was politically opposed to, such as the British soldiers.
He felt that they were innocent until proven guilty. And he felt that they had a right to a defense. He asked John Adams to help him with this trial, mainly according to family legend, because when he uh, became an attorney, he had such a, a zeal for, for liberty and was so outspoken. He actually gave the commencement speech at Harvard in, um, I believe it was 1763. And that's where Sam Adams came to notice him because of his zealous speech on liberty. That when he became an attorney, the governor denied him the robe of a barrister. And basically what that meant from what the family has passed down through the years is that he could not try a case before a jury. You had to have the barrister's robe to do that. He could do all the legwork, depositions, everything involved in it in the trial, except to actually present. And he needed to have an attorney with him that could present before the jury. Thus, he went to John Adams. But the reality of the situation was when they went to trial, Josiah did in fact take part in going before the jury and nobody objected because even at his very young age, the other attorneys respected his um, genius in, the, in colonial law and they just let him do it. So here we have in this situation that is better than any fiction that can be brought out on TV or in a book, a brother pitted against a brother almost as a prophecy of the civil war that was coming. And each of these brothers was standing on the opposite side of what they believed politically. The outcome of that trial was that Josiah Quincy Jr. and Sam Adams won, I'm sorry, John Adams won that case. After the Boston massacre, uh, the British troops were evacuated from Boston by the governor. So this would have been set in the 17, 1770, 1771 when the British left. Now, as I said, um, the Long Room Club got established in about 1765. Joseph Warren was a member from 65 on, probably the second youngest member of the club. Josiah Quincy Jr. would have been the youngest member as far as we know. Um, in 1761, Joseph joined or was initiated into St. Andrew's Lodge in Boston, along with Paul Revere. That's how he met Paul Revere in the first place. So he was in his apprenticeship at that time as a medical apprentice, quite young. And I'm, I'll say this right up front, so there are you know, no mistakes here about what I am saying. I call it the Masonic connection. I believe and I know for a fact, Paul Revere believed fully in Freemasonry. And I believe Joseph Warren did as well. They were not using Freemasonry as a, a means to an end. They believed in it, but they also understood how it would work if they were in a high position in Freemasonry. I've spoken many times to, um, to lodges. Um, Joseph had no part in Freemasonry really from 1761 until 1765. We see him coming back in and getting involved at that point. He was establishing, getting his education, establishing his practice, he was busy. So he came back in 1765 and um, he just took off. He became master mason, and then by 1769, he was appointed the uh, provincial grand master of masons in Boston with, and within 100 miles of the same. And in 1772, he was appointed from Scotland grand master of masons for the continent of America. Now that's pretty huge. In other words, people like George Washington knew who Joseph Warren was because Washington being a Mason would know of Warren and this appointment he received. 
both see, uh, Joseph and Paul rose to the highest um, degree in Freemasonry at that time, which was the Royal Arch degree. Uh, Paul actually obtained that first, the Royal Arch degree and became a Knight Templar in 1769 and Warren did it after him. Now, what does this mean? And why am I bringing it up? Most, if not all of the British officers who were in Boston when this was happening initially, when they were rising in the ranks of Freemasonry, were Freemasons. And though politics is not discussed in a lodge, there's a mutual respect between these, these brother Masons. And with Warren and Revere, attaining the highest degree available at that time, it put them both on even keel with any of the British officers who had already obtained this degree. With Warren appointed as head of Freemasons in North America, he was in a sense, as far as Freemasonry was concerned, um, superior to the British officers that might attend his launch. This gave them as I said, a guaranteed respect, but also offered protection to a point, to a point for themselves, not only for themselves, but for their families as well. Because even to this day, Masons believe that if a fellow Mason is injured or killed or something happens, that they are responsible for helping out the family of that Mason, protecting the family of that Mason, if you will. Very important. And most all of um, the members probably of the Long Room Club were Masons, I think all but John Adams. So then we're moving forward, we go through the Boston Massacre, the British leave, uh, the Bostonians are thrilled to have their, their city back, but the taxes and the parliamentary acts continue to come just the same. And there was a T put on this ta uh, tax put on this T. Basically, the Americans had um, been boycotting British goods for quite a while, and it was uh, wreaking havoc in Great Britain. The T was piling up. They wanted to get rid of it. They were going to try to force it on the Americans in Boston um, by selling it for a reduced price, but making certain that it still had that little bit of a tax. And uh, that wasn't going to go over well with the Bostonians. So they attempted to have the ship sent back to Great Britain. Um, and the British would have nothing to do with that. They were determined that the ships would be unloaded. Uh, the Bostonians could not let that happen because of this tax that, that was being forced upon them. They felt they could not let this happen. So they planned to go aboard these ships. Um, they disguised themselves so they would not be recognized and boarded the ships um, at night. Joseph Warren and Paul Revere, we know, uh, headed up this group. They were each on one of the ships uh, as leaders. We know this because some of the Bostonians decided to sing a song the next day about throwing the tea in the harbor and they mentioned Warren and Revere, which really wasn't too swift, um, but they did it just the same. Now, uh, in, in taking the tea off the ship, the rule was that there was to be no damage to any of the ships whatsoever. They were to destroy the tea and nothing else. It was a protest against the tax on tea. They were not to take any of the tea with them. They were to destroy it. Very strict and stringent rules about how they would go about doing this. But just the same, um, they did destroy the tea and uh, Parliament wasn't too thrilled with them, nor the king when they found out about it, nor were some of the sister colonies in the South. Some opposed them. Boston um, was seen by some of the other colonies as a rabble rousing city that was just stirring up trouble and wanting to take over all the colonies on their own. 
a lot of different points of view, but then there were the colonies that were concerned about the Bostonians and appreciated the stance they were taking. Following the Boston Tea Party, um, the coercive acts, uh, they, have, uh, they were referred to as a few different things. It was basically the Boston Port Bill that came from Great Britain in response. The colonists referred to them as the coercive acts or the intolerable acts or punitive acts. It was basically a punishment for the destruction of the tea. And it was passed in March of 1774 and would go into effect in June. And in a nutshell, the, the ports of Boston would be totally shut down except to uh, traffic from Great Britain specifically, you know, uh, blessed by parliament and coming to Boston. This meant hundreds upon hundreds of men were out of work because Boston was a major shipping port. The Massachusetts government, as it was at the time, was made illegal by the British, de declared illegal, um, and disbanded. A military governor would come in to replace the government. The Justice Act came about uh, where people that were, were charged with crimes weren't necessarily tried in Boston. They were shipped to as far as Halifax to be tried without a jury of their peers. Uh, the Quartering Act, the troops came back and they were allowed to basically just take over, to be able to take over properties without question and the Quebec Act, which opened up some of the Western lands that the colonists longed to go to and um, pioneer, it opened it up to French settlers, not the English settlers. So this caused quite a stir. Now, in response to this, many of the sister colonies sent um, money, sent animals, livestock, um, sent different things for the Bostonians to help them through this difficult time. Again, men out of jobs. The ports north of Boston, this, the towns north of Boston opened their ports to Boston shipping. So um, it was a great support to the Bostonians and helped them through this time. And this is when I, I had mentioned earlier, the um, donation committee was established because of the monies and the supplies sent from the other colonies that they would put the men to work in Boston that lost their jobs in the shipping industry and pay them from that money. They would put them to work basically to fix the infrastructure in Boston that needed fixing. Josiah Quincy Jr. Um, wrote the response to the Boston Port Bill, which would circulate through Europe. His name was known in Europe. In September of 74, the first Continental Congress um, determined to meet. And again, this came about because of the the communications, the factual communications between the colonies set up by the intercolonial committees of correspondence. And when the troops came back to Boston and Boston was in such a bad state, they determined that delegates from each of the colonies would meet in Philadelphia. Now, around the same time, Josiah Quincy Jr boarded a ship and secretly left Boston to go to England. It was a mission that they felt, the members of the Long Room Club felt had to be undertaken, but all of them basically were fearful of uh, volunteering for, to, to do this. Josiah Quincy Jr. said he would do it, First, because he felt that he would not be arrested if he was found in Great Britain, um, where the others would probably be arrested for sedition if they were found there. He had um, defended the British troops in the Boston Massacre trials, and it was known in England. 
His brother was the Solicitor General in Massachusetts, and that was known in England. And then if all us failed and he was arrested, he said he wasn't afraid because he was dying of what was called consumption at the time anyway. And so he was the best fitted to go. Consumption we refer to today as tuberculosis. After Josiah left, and as the first Continental Congress was meeting, um, Warren was basically in charge in Boston. Of course, John Adams and Sam Adams were part of the First Continental Congress. John Hancock was not at the First Continental Congress. Warren had been um, had become the president of the illegal. Massachusetts Provincial Congress, as I told you, uh, Massachusetts government was disbanded and there was a military governor, General Thomas Gage, overseeing the government. So it was an illegal uh, Congress. And Warren and the uh, Adamses were corresponding with each other and they were aware of the tensions in Boston in Philadelphia. And Warren was aware that other delegates from other colonies weren't taking the Massachusetts delegates seriously. As I said earlier, some of them saw them as a bunch of rabble rousers just causing trouble and that the Boston Tea Party never had to take place in the first place and this type of, of thing going on. And Sam Adams and John Adams and the other delegates from Massachusetts were, were very quiet um, as the Congress met because they were afraid of, you know, setting off disputes and problems. So they, they were a bit timid at a time when they, they really couldn't afford to be timid. And um, Joseph Warren was aware of this and he um, wrote what became known as the Suffolk Resolves. It was approved by the Provincial Congress and it was, um, would be sent to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The, the Suffolk Resolves was written in September of 1774. You can see the, the blue colonial house here. That's a house in Milton that is a museum now referred to as the Suffolk Resolves House. It was where the resolves were first presented to the public. Um, so Joseph Warren had his friend, Paul Revere, take the Suffolk resolves to Philadelphia. And quite honestly, this was probably the most important ride Paul Revere made. Uh, things had to start happening in Philadelphia because Boston was in trouble. When Paul Revere arrived, he brought the, um, the Suffolk Resolves over to the then president of the Congress and handed it to him. He went over and we're told he sat down next to Sam Adams. Sam Adams was terrified upon seeing Revere and seeing him hand the papers to the president that it was going to report that blood had already been shed in Boston. And Revere assured him that everything was okay. Up until that point, the First Continental Congress could not agree or move forward at all. Um, Sam Adams's account of the reading of the Suffolk Resolves was that it brought tears to the eyes of many of the de delegates and they finally were ready to talk. Um, basically, it laid out uh, the ways in which the colonists could oppose, peacefully oppose the British and something for all of the colonies to take part in, not just Massachusetts. Now, from this, one of the most important things that came down was that the delegates in Congress agreed that they would come to the aid of Boston, of Massachusetts, if they needed them, only if, and I have to emphasize this, only if the British were the aggressors. If the Americans were the aggressors, then the sister colonies were not duty bound to come and help out Massachusetts. 
And even though some of the colonies certain, certainly would, such as the other New England colonies, uh, many of the Southern colonies just didn't trust the Massachusetts Bay Colony enough to do that. And so it was vital, vital that the British had to be the aggressors to get the support of the rest of the colonies. After the first Continental Congress, um, the delegates came back and they basically hid out while awaiting um, their return to Philadelphia. And this time for the Second Continental Congress, John Hancock would go as well. Uh, John Adams went to his farm in Braintree, which is now Quincy, Massachusetts. And Hancock and Adams uh, hid out or stayed in Lexington at the home of uh, John Hancock's family called the Hancock Clark House in Lexington. It still stands to this day. In the meantime, the other page, all the Patriot leaders basically were leaving Boston. They knew trouble was coming. They had heard that not only did they already have 3000 British troops in Boston, but another thousand troops were headed to Boston along with three more generals. General Thomas Gage, as I said, was now the military governor. Um, as far as those in, in parliament and the king were concerned, he wasn't acting fast enough to squelch this rebellion. And so more troops would be sent along with these generals to put pressure on Gage. Dr. Joseph Warren, was the one trying to hold things together in Boston as the president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. And he was also made chairman of the Committee of Safety. So he would frequently meet with Thomas Gage um, just to try to keep the peace. It was a horrific time, as I said, in the, the first um, occupation of Boston as well. You have these young troops in Boston, boys were being beat up, um, men being pushed around and beat up by the soldiers. And there were many rapes also occurring. And it was Warren's duty to keep the peace as much as possible because again, the pressure was that the British had to be the aggressors for the sister colonies to help out. And Warren knew this. And so it was his duty to go to Gage to try to figure things out and his duty to keep the men in Boston under control, even though perhaps their wives, sisters and daughters were being raped. Now, Warren set up a network of spies during this period to find out what the British were up to. Again, he knew a thousand troops were coming. He knew three more generals were coming, but he didn't have details of when all this might come down and what would happen when it did. Um, pressure was on Gage to move, as I said, so he suspected Gage might try to move before these troops even came to reinforce him. And so he was getting information from the spy network. Now, Warren, and when I do this in person, I don't show this picture up front. So <laughs> you guys have a head up here. He had one person that was giving him information that he said he would take the identity of this person to the grave with him. And he did. But it has been assumed through the years that the person that was giving him very detailed information about the movements of the British was in fact the wife of General Thomas Gage, her name Margaret Kimball Gage, and you can see her, her beautiful portrait here. Now, Margaret Kimball Gage was a colonist. She was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, she dearly loved her husband, Thomas Gage, and they had many children together, but she loved the colonists as well, and her heart was torn. And we know this for a fact because she put it in her own journal, how, how her heart was torn over what was happening with the colonies in Great Britain. After um, basically what we think she told Warren was that Gage was going to be moving the troops on April 18th um, across 
to, to go into the countryside to Lexington and Concord to take hold of the supplies the colonists were hiding out that way. And also, as I said, John, um, John Hancock and Sam Adams were staying in Lexington. There were warrants for the arrest of John Hancock, Sam Adams, and Joseph Warren. And we can say this much for Samuel Quincy, the Solicitor General. He did not act on those warrants. He held back on them. But now with the pressure coming down on Thomas Gage in all likelihood, um, these men would be arrested. So not only did Warren need to warn the countryside that the British were coming out to take hold of the supplies that were stored in Concord, but also to warn um, Hancock and Adams that they may be arrested and they needed to flee. And it is believed that Margaret Kimball Gage is the one that told Warren that these troops would be moving on the night of April 18th. Around 10 o'clock that night, Joseph Warren called Billy Dawes and Paul Revere to his home. Um, we like to say it was Paul Revere's ride, but it was also Billy Dawes and there were at least three other others who were involved in it. Um, up until the writing of Longfellow's poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, all these facts were well known to every school child in America. Uh, the name of Joseph Warren was quite well known in the part he played in all of this. It was Longfellow's poem that kind of switched things out and put the focus on Paul Revere. And hey, Paul Revere was a great guy. I'm not saying anything about that, but the, just like the Boston Massacre trials, there's a lot more behind that night and who was involved in it. Billy Dawes was sent out um, by land. He was good at play acting, they said, and he could make his way past the British guards at the Boston Neck to get out to the countryside by acting like a drunken farmer. And so he did. Paul Revere went by, went across the river and then there was a horse waiting for him on the other side and he went through the countryside, met up, as I said, with a few other individuals to spread spread the news of uh, the British coming, even though uh, the countryside had been prepared and warned a few days earlier, they certainly know this might be happening. Uh, Revere and Dawes and the others came with more details of what was occurring. Hancock and Adams, as I said, were in Lexington and uh, Revere made it to the house, Dawes did too, as a matter of fact, to warn them and they were going to go into hiding before the British reached Lexington in the wee hours of the morning. But Hancock um, wanted Paul Revere to do something first. He had a trunk that was over at one of the taverns in Lexington, and it was filled with papers uh, that would basically cause a lot of trouble if the British got hold of them uh, with the names and information on these papers. So Hancock told Paul Revere to go over to the tavern with another man and get this trunk and take the trunk and hide it before the British got hold of it. And then um, Hancock and Sam Adams left and they hid out actually in the swamps in Woburn, Massachusetts that night and the next day. <clears throat> and if anybody knows uh, any details about the relationship between Hancock and Adams. It was very much a love-hate relationship. And so just to think that they were hanging out in the swamps is kind of comical. Um, but they in fact had to do that to save their lives. Now, Hancock, uh, uh, Paul Revere on the other hand is going to get this trunk and he's got to get this before the British get to the Lexington Green. Now, I want you to consider this. Hank, uh, I'm getting my names mixed up here. Sorry, folks. Paul Revere had been part of the Long Room Club since 1765. And here we are in 1775, okay? 10 years. And the Long Room Club was preparing, was trying to avoid all of this for most of its existence, but then preparing for this moment. 
when they realized it was inevitable. And uh, Revere is out there getting this trunk and he's kind of carrying it across the Lexington Green to get it to safety and the British are approaching and they can hear the British approaching, obviously. It would be quite loud with the horses and marching. And uh, Revere gets it to the edge of the green and into the woods and he's hidden when the first shot is fired on the Lexington Green. Now, Revere would meet up with Joseph Warren later that day, and it was Joseph Warren's responsibility as president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress to notify those throughout the colonies, as well as friends in um, England and throughout Europe of the occurrences of that day. And remember again, the British had to be the aggressors. Now, when uh, Warren met with Revere that day, Revere denied that he knew who fired the first shot. He said he didn't see it. He was too busy getting Hancock's trunk off the green. <clears throat> and I guess we can believe that. He stuck to that. Um, but before he would have seen Joseph Warren that day, later that day, he would have been in touch with Sam Adams. And one has to wonder if he was told to deny what he said, what he saw occur on the green. It's very difficult to believe that given his 10 years of preparation that he wasn't watching exactly what was coming down on the green, but he never said. So we don't know for a fact who fired that first shot in Lexington, but we do know that the British fired first at the Concord Bridge. And that would be what Warren would write to the sister colonies um, and what the delegates from Massachusetts would take to the Second Continental Congress. From this moment, uh, well, it was right after that, that um, Adams and Hancock, both Adamses and Hancock would leave for Philadelphia. Uh, Warren is basically in charge of everything that's coming down at this point. It's referred to by historians as Warren's 60 days from the battles of Lexington and Concord to the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was responsible as president, as chairman of the Committee of Safety, which was, which was established to um, see to the needs of the men that would come and fight. He was responsible for feeding, clothing, sheltering, supplying, and caring for the medical needs of 16,000 men that showed up from the neighboring colonies, mainly the New England colonies initially. He was writing, as I said, to uh, Sam Adams mainly uh, about everything that was going on. And he was sharing with Sam how much he loved these men that had turned out to fight. But he understood their fears and he understood their uh, deprivations. They, they were short on supplies. They didn't have much food. And some of these men were starting to steal from neighboring farms and this type of thing. And he was concerned about all of this. And he was imploring CM Adams to encourage the Congress to appoint a commander in chief. And he even suggested that Washington be the man that that they appoint. In the meantime, he was able to hold it together. Now you have to um, step back and look at the situation of the provincial army at this point. It's a bunch of militia companies from different colonies. Um, they all have different leaders. Massachusetts is not gonna obey the officers from New Hampshire. Connecticut's not gonna obey the officers from Vermont. I mean, this was just kind of a ragtag army thrown together. And the one uniting thing in all of this, the one person that could unite them was Joseph Warren. Again, they had all heard of Warren, his, his Masonic position, and most of these men were Freemasons or certainly um, had knowledge of it. And they had a great respect for Joseph Warren. 
He was also for 10 years educating the public through newspaper articles and this type of thing. So he was well known and well respected and he was holding it all together for these 60 days. So on the eve of Bunker Hill, June 16th, as president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and chairman of the Committee of Safety, he oversaw the plans of the pending battle. Uh, how many men to send out that night to Bunker Hill, to Breedsville? Um, how many uh, reinforcements would be needed the next day? The initial group of men, uh, I think it was 500, that were sent out that night to build the fortification, the redoubt, were supposed to be relieved the next morning. The fresh troops were to be brought in with proper supplies to face the British, meaning um, muskets and uh, lead balls, powder, all of that water, what they basic necessities. So he was overseeing all these plans. That evening, he dined with the family that he was living with, the Palmers in Watertown. And um, the wife of young Mr. Palmer, Betsy Palmer, had been a patient of his since she was a child. And now she was a young mother herself here. And Betsy Palmer tells us that during dinner, Warren got up and went over to pour some wine at the, um, the side table. And Betsy got up to go tend to something, whether it was the children or what, we don't really know. But as she passed Joseph Warren, and he would refer to her as my little girl, which he did since she was a child. And he said, my little girl, aren't you going to stay and have a glass of wine with me? And she said, he lowered his voice so that only she could hear it. And he said, because I'm going to the hill tomorrow and I'm not coming off. It seems he had a premonition of what was to come. Um, after that, he tried to sleep that night. He had a meeting early in the morning with the Provincial Congress. Um, he was in Watertown that night. The Provincial Congress was meeting in Charlestown. So he um, tossed and turned all night, couldn't sleep, knowing what was to come down the next morning, worrying about the plans, you know, if, 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 all the ifs that could go wrong. And uh, he also had a, a, my, what we would probably refer to as a migraine. He suffered with them frequently during these 60 days with the stress on him. He wasn't eating properly, he wasn't sleeping properly, and he was suffering with these migraines. But still people that witnessed them, this in journals, what they were seeing said that he just carried it as if he didn't have all these stresses and all this pain. He just held it all together during this time. He decided because he couldn't sleep that he was going to ride over to Charleston. Oh, I spelled it wrong there. I'm sorry. Um, and um, be there for the meeting. And he just happened to put on his finest clothes that night before he rode over. He was confronted once he got there by Elbridge Jerry, who was a friend and not, I mean, Elbridge Jerry met him at the door as he came in and basically told them he looked awful, that he was, he looked sick and he needed to go get some sleep. And um, so finally Warren said that he would go up and try to lay down. And he told Elbridge Jerry to make sure he woke him for the meeting of the Provincial Congress the next morning. Jerry was, um, a part, a member of that Congress. And he told um, Jerry that he planned to go to Bunker Hill uh, the next morning. Uh, and Jerry tried to talk him out of it, saying, you're needed, you're needed here. You're needed in Congress. We need you behind the scenes here. And Warren replied to him in Latin, uh, basically, it is good and it is right to die for one's country. And then he went up and again reminded Elbridge Jerry to wake him in the morning for the meeting. Um, he finally did fall asleep. And being a physician, 
he could sleep through almost anything. You know, back then physicians were called out at all times. They had to get sleep when they could get sleep. And loud noises, they had trained themselves that loud noises didn't wake them necessarily. So even though the cannon started firing in the morning from the ships out on the river, um, Warren slept through that. The, um, the Provincial Congress met. Elbridge Jerry refused to wake Warren up, hoping that he would just sleep through the morning. He was so exhausted and sick, but he left the minutes of the meeting on the table downstairs for Warren to see when he did wake up. And um, there was a young doctor that came from Boston who had been one of Joseph Warren's own apprentices, uh, David Townsend. And when he heard the cannon fire that morning and was told that there would be a battle, he made his way over and he was trying to find somebody that could direct him where to go to take care of the wounded that day. And he wandered into this house that um, Warren was asleep in and there was nobody there at the time. And he kind of walked through the house just looking if he could see somebody. And even though Warren could sleep through the cannon fire, he could sleep through the meeting that occurred downstairs that morning. Um, that light tap on the door, he was trained to react to. And when David Townsend knocked on the door, Warren did wake up. He was disoriented. It was certainly later in the day that he anticipated it would be when he woke up. Um, he just had, uh, his, his headache was lingering a bit. He said he was going to go have some chamomile tea and read the minutes to the meeting and then make his way over to the hill. Um, as he read the, the minutes to the meeting, he realized that a grave mistake had been made the night before. The redoubt was supposed to have been built on Bunker Hill, but it was actually built on Breed's Hill, which was closer to the river and less um, difficult for the British to approach. It was too late now, certainly, to do anything about it. And even the engineers that had made that decision during the night realized the foolishness of it when the sun came up and they could see how much closer they were to the river. Um, but Warren was going to make his way over there just the same and encourage the troops. He did make his way over. He stopped on um, Bunker Hill where troops were waiting to relieve the men that had built the redoubt overnight. And these men were fearful. The cannons were already firing. These guys were farmers. They weren't soldiers. They had never seen anything like this and they were scared. And even though they were supposed to reinforce the men that had been there all night, even though they were supposed to bring the proper ammunition over with them and water and food and basic necessities, they were hesitating. And um, Warren ordered them to move forward and he made his way over to the redoubt on his own. The men within the redoubt had been up all night building. They were exhausted. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They were hot. It was June 17th, but it was an unusually warm day. They estimate that the temperatures were probably in the 90s, close to the 90s anyway. And um, Warren assured them that the reinforcements were coming, believing fully that they were. And he was offered command by um, Colonel Prescott, who was in the redoubt at the time commanding, because Warren had applied to become a general in the Massachusetts militia. Even though he had the position of president and chairman of the Committee of Safety, those weren't positions he sought out. He was elected to those. Basically, they felt he was the best person for those positions and kind of forced them on him, you might say. But what he wanted to do was to be a, a military leader in this. And um, three days prior, as I said, he had uh, been uh, not officially commissioned, but told that he would become general. But since it was not official, he told Prescott that he was not going to take command that day, that he came as a volunteer and to encourage the troops. And he stayed by Prescott's side, but Prescott basically gave the orders 
throughout that day. Um, and we could go into great detail on the actual battle that took place, the strategies and what the British did wrong, um, what the Americans did wrong, but there's no time. <laughs> so we're gonna quickly go through this one too. As I said, uh, the region was basically an earthen wall and um, it was the colonists felt comfortable if they could stand behind something for protection, unlike the British that would just go right out in the open field with their, their bright red uniforms, you know? And um, again, they were waiting for the reinforcements, but as the British started to assemble on the shore, the banks of the river below, the reinforcements still weren't coming over. And so Prescott uh, prepared the men to take this first attack or attempted to prepare them. And the British kind of were just, you know, kind of poo-pooing, ha ha the whole situation, um, thinking it was going to just be an easy day for them. And in reality, it should have been. And they kind of had a little picnic on the beach before they, they formed to march up. And the first formation came and it, before they actually started to march up, they decided that they, well, no, I'm sorry, that came on the second attack, so I take that back. So they come up in formation and word was given within the redoubt. We do not know who gave the order exactly, but they were told not to fire upon the British until they could see the whites of their, their eyes. And basically that was said because they lacked ammunition, they lacked powder, they lacked lead balls, and they could not afford to, you know, use it up quickly. They had to be very careful. And so saying that they were going to allow the British to come uncomfortably close before they would fire. And that's exactly what they did. And that first volley was absolutely deadly to the British. Um, it stunned them. Uh, they didn't anticipate this and uh, many, many were killed, many wounded, many fell. Now at this point already, you have this hot, hot June day and these bodies, these wounded men are just being left out in the sun to bake basically as the British troops retreated in disorder for the most part. That's how stunned they were by all of it. And the other thing about this hill, it had been farmland to, um, to graze um, sheep. So there were all kinds of fencing, fences um, that the, the grass had grown up around. So the British couldn't even see this fencing as they were climbing the hill. So they're tripping over this fencing. Um, it was just absolutely devastating for them, not what they anticipated at all. They did retreat. Um, again, the men in the redoubt are waiting for these reinforcements and they're coming to the reality that the reinforcements are not coming. So there will be no fresh men. There will be no supplies to back up um, what they've already used up. And there would be uh, no water, I mean, under, under this brutal heat. In the meantime, the British had decided that they were going to set Charleston ablaze because the Americans had put some snipers over in the old houses, the wooden houses in Charleston to pick off the British as they came up the hill. So the British uh, set the town ablaze and, um, so now you don't just have the heat of that day and the dust coming from the dry earthen floor of the redoubt as the men scuffled around, but you have this heavy thick smoke coming up over them as well. The British regrouped and attacked a second time. Um, and again, the Americans waited till they got even closer than the first attack before they fired and they took down many, many, many of them. And again, the British retreated. The British would be reinforced by troops from Boston and they would make a third attack. By this time, the Americans had run out of uh, the lead. They had some powder left, but not enough lead balls. 
So they began, began loading the muskets with rocks and nails, whatever they could find to load them with. And it wasn't long before the British realized this, that what was being fired wasn't, mus uh, wasn't musket balls. And uh, they kind of went wild when they realized this, the British, and they attacked uh, with even more force because of all the damage that they had done to them. When they realized the Americans were out of ammunition, it just, it just made them go after them all the more. And they started climbing the walls of the redoubt. And with what little powder was left with the rocks and the, the nails, uh, the Americans held back and waited till the British were actually scaling the walls before they would use what was left of their um, ammunition. And at this point, it was realized that their only hope now was to, to retreat. And so uh, a few of the colonial soldiers offered to enter into hand-to-hand -hand combat the use of swords, whatever swords were there, were passed around to those who were willing to stay to um, protect the ones who were going to retreat. Now, um, again, there was smoke from Charleston that hung over can the redoubt. Yes. Can I just interrupt for a second? I apologize. Um, we're, we're like 15 minutes past our normal allotted time. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you close to being almost? Connected? I am, yes. Yeah. Okay. I just sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. It's a fascinating conversation, and I just wanted to let you know that we are sort of running a little bit late on time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So we have the smoke hanging over them. We have the dust from the floor. We have cannons still coming from the ships in the river, and people were were up on the rooftops in Boston screaming and yelling. And in the midst of all of this insanity, there was only one way to get out of this redoubt. And visibility was so poor that the British, once they entered the redoubt, didn't dare fire their uh, guns because they couldn't see who they were firing upon. And the men leaving, the only way they could find that exit was to actually put their hands up against the earthen wall and follow the wall to the exit. And uh, most of them made it out. Uh, Warren actually made it out himself. He had been stabbed by a bayonet or a sword. We don't know exactly, but he did have an, a wound. And it seemed he knew it was a fatal wound. Two of the colonists tried to help him and offered to help him down off the hill. And he told them he was a dead man and they needed to leave. Um, the British, uh, there was a, a Major Small in the British um, Army who spotted Warren outside the redoubt. And again, as I said, the British officers would have known him, would have taken part in the Masonic Lodge in meetings. And he called out to Warren to, you know, for God's sake, surrender is what he said he screamed out to him. And he said in his own journal that Warren turned and looked at him and smiled. And to the side of Major Small were five uh, British soldiers who had their muskets aimed at Warren because they were told by Thomas Gage that if anybody took him down that they would be rewarded. And Major Small saw these muskets and he took his own sword and tried to push them down but couldn't get all of them and the one on the very end did shoot Warren and hit him in the, in the head. This is a famous um, drawing by John Trumbull of the death of Warren on Bunker Hill. And um, I wanted to go into some of, you know, finding him up there and Paul Revere and that type of thing, but we don't have time for it, I guess. Um, Warren was buried in a mass grave on Bunker Hill. He was taken out of that mass grave at least once we know because one of the generals that had just come over had never met him and wanted to look upon his body not believing that he had put himself in danger. About a year after the battle, the British evacuated Boston. Actually, uh, George Washington went to view the battle site and one of his aides journaled that Washington said that they had lost their commander in chief on Bunker Hill, referring to Joseph Warren. 
He was buried in a cemetery in Boston, the Granary Cemetery. Um, and then he was moved from there to St. Paul's Cathedral to their uh, cemetery. But as Boston expanded, as you can see, these build, big buildings surrounding St. Paul's, the, many of the bodies were moved elsewhere and Warren's body was moved at that time as well to a place in Jamaica Plain called Pine Hill Cemetery where he remains today. When he was buried at Bunker Hill, um, one of the British soldiers one, was in the process of attempting to cut off his head. And he was stopped by one of the British officers uh, and ordered to just bury him uh, with Christian dignity. When his body was moved from St. Paul's to Jamaica Plain, um, Americans did what the British attempted and they took the skull and buried the rest of the body without the skull and put it on display for a period of time. You can see in the skull, the, uh, the bullet hole on the, um, the right side as you're looking at the skull facing you and then coming through the back of the head and the back of the skull. Um, and I'll just finish with this. In 1825, the Bunker Hill Monument was dedicated and Daniel Webster was the orator. Um, in the audience were many who had survived the battle and actually um, uh, Lafayette, General Lafayette was there as well. And as Daniel Webster gave his talk, well into his speech, he said this, but ah him, the first great martyr in this great cause, him, the premature victim of his own self-devoting heart, him, the head of our civil councils and the destined leader of our military bands, whom nothing brought hither but the unquenchable fire of his own spirit, him, cut off by providence in the hour of overwhelming anxiety and thick gloom. Falling ere he saw the state of his country, the star of his country rise, pouring out his generous blood like water before he knew whether it would fertilize a land of freedom or of bondage. How shall I struggle with the emotions that stuffle the utterance of thy name? Our poor work may perish, but thine shall endure. This monument may molder away, the solid ground it rests upon may sink down to a level with the sea, but thy memory shall not fail. Wheresoever among men a heart shall be found that beats to the transports of patriotism and liberty, its aspiration shall be acclaimed kindred with thy spirit. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but I am certainly willing to, um, to take any. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for that wonderful and fascinating talk. If you want, you can stop sharing your screen. Um, I think it should okay. be a red button kind of near the top. I see that uh, the glasses on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those always help, don't they? Um, so we we can stick around for a couple of minutes um, if anybody has any particular questions for Janet. Um, I know I have, I have a couple um, from our uh, lecture coordinator, Don Broderick. Um, and so, you know, if people are interested in, um, in having particular questions answered, then um, we can do that. Obviously, if you need to head on out, then thank you for, for listening. Um, but I'll get started with, with one quick question here. Um, talking about, so the, the book that you wrote, Liberty's Martyr, um, it's sort of a mixture of, of, you know, history and also it being, you know, more of a novel in, in that kind of way. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you went about writing this kind of mixture of genres in a way? Um, and, you know, what it was like to do, you know, such intense research for something that, that also has this, these elements of fiction. Um, my, I purposed in the beginning to do it in a fictional setting just because I know a lot of people will not pick up a biography or a text. And I was, wanted to educate them on this. And I also wanted to, to make these individuals uh, live because they did live and they had families and they had deep friendships with one another. So in, in researching Warren himself, um, it was researching Sam Adams and Paul Revere and Josiah Quincy and how they related 
to each other. The American Revolution wasn't one person. It was a group of people that came together and worked together. And that's what I wanted to portray in this story. As far as the research on Warren goes, I started that, it was 30 plus years ago, probably about 34 years ago. And you didn't have the computer system like you have now. <laughs> so you had, to, you had to get out there and search it out. And it was a lot of fun, actually. I, I love the research. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that all sounds wonderful. And, and thank you so much again for taking the time to, to tell us all about this. We've got a few, they're not questions that are coming in. They're just saying thank you very much, Janet, for, for this wonderful um, presentation from Jamie and from Richard. Yeah. Um, it really, it's, it's so wonderful getting to hear about, you know, this figure who used to be very well known and then now has kind of um, come out of a lot of the, the textbooks in a way um, and to hear how much he influenced what was obviously the foundational <laughs> time in, in American history. Well, quite honestly, if he, and I will say Josiah Quincy Jr. too, Josiah Quincy died on his way back from that mission, by the way, um, and, and saying that he had information to share with Joseph Warren and Sam Adams that he didn't dare put in writing, and he died with that information. But had they not faced the challenges put before them, um, our, our history would be vastly different. And when you stop to think, and I didn't, when Joseph Warren died, he was 35 years old. When Josiah Quincy died, he was 31 years old. I mean, they accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. Truly, truly remarkable lives that they had and, and yet such a short time. Well, thank you so much, Janet. Kevin, Kevin, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I was just going to say, Janet, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, Would you be willing to share your uh, email address if anybody wants to write you oh, yeah. uh, any questions directly? Yes, um, it's Janet Euler, J-A-N-E-T-U-H-L-A-R at Comcast.net. And I also do have a website, which is www.JanetEuler.net. Excellent. Thank you very much. We uh, truly appreciate it. I apologize. I had to jump in there, but. That's okay. Um, I, I don't even know the time. I get so carried away with it. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining us this, af uh, this afternoon. And uh, we, I'm sure you enjoyed Janet's talk and. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in future lectures, and please come visit us at the Atwood Museum. Have a great evening, everybody.